Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine that promises none of our phone records are being surveilled by the NSA or any uh, House subcommittees on intelligence. Uh, We do gather up all this for you so that when people confront you at parties, Christmas gatherings, the odd parade, uh, or just around the house, you have facts that you can back this up with in a conversational form. And please, please, we don't want to go uh, the Hatfields and McCoys just over politics, right? Our first guest this week, uh, by the way, you can go and find previous editions of this program up on our YouTube channel under the banner Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Hans von Spakovsky is back on the program with us. He is the manager of election law reform and senior fellow with the Mies Center for Legal and Justice Studies at the Heritage Foundation. We might need to dedicate the entire program to Hans uh, this week because I, I, but, but first and foremost, I want to get into the murky areas of a media mogul running for any elected office. Uh, Hans, welcome back to the program. How was your Thanksgiving? I hope your holiday season is going well. Oh, it was going great, and uh, you know, I had great fun watching the uh, University of Virginia versus Virginia uh-huh. Tech game and watching UVA beat beat Virginia Tech for the first time in 15 years. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, This program probably airs after uh, the Clemson game in a lot of places, so we don't know what happens there, but I certainly hope they can cover, uh, given that I think Clemson is uh, a four-touchdown favorite right now, which I think is ridiculous. Uh, But, Hans, let's let's begin – I I have, having done this for 33 years, on several occasions been approached by people who said, you should run for, and I've poked around election laws that regards the media, and, and I see ambiguity where you know a media company would have to provide equal time to an opponent of one of their broadcasters um, if they were to run for office. And, and usually media companies aren't wanting to do that because that's free airtime. Uh, so they usually tell an employee if he runs for office, you got to get off the air until, you know, the election is done or, or you know, you, you're out of office and you, you want to come back with your tail between your legs. So take us into the other side of this. Now, this is the owner of the media company whose name is on the media company running for president in the case of Michael Bloomberg. So where, where are the laws on this? Well, you know, under, under federal campaign finance law and uh, I know about this because I served as a commissioner for two years on the Federal Election Commission, which enforces the law. Um, as you know, corporations cannot contribute directly to a a federal candidate, including somebody running for president. And so, for example, it would be highly illegal for um, ABC or CNN to run an ad in favor of Michael Bloomberg and not charge him for it, because Mm -hmm. that would be considered a direct contribution. Um, There is an exemption for media companies, um, media companies, uh, you know, their editorial pages, which may support or not support a candidate. Uh, That's not considered a contribution. Um, But that media coverage, that media exemption, um, only applies to candidates who actually own a media company like Michael Bloomberg, who, of course, uh, owns mm. Bloomberg News. It only applies under the, the law and the, and the regulations if um, they are providing uh, fair and full coverage of all of that candidate's opponents. Okay. So, so it's it's very clear that yeah, you don't you don't you know, if you own a media company, yeah, you don't have to get rid of your ownership, but that media company is going to have to cover the race you are in just like they would cover any other race so that they are not basically making a contribution mm-hmm. to your to your campaign by helping you out. It sounds like something there would be some scrutiny as well that would make it you know, more so than even a regular campaign coverage because you would have to make sure your records are so well detailed that there could be no loophole where somebody could point at and say, you know, oh, look, there's collusion right there or anything like that, right? Yes. No, that's a, that's exactly right. And that's why I actually think Michael Bloomberg is in potential trouble uh, I think he's he. It's a possi- strong possibility he's actually violating federal law because of the announcement that was made by Bloomberg that um, 
Bloomberg News that because their owner is now in the presidential campaign, um, they're only going to be doing stories about Donald Trump. Yeah. They're not going to cover Bloomberg and they're not going to cover any of his other opponents in the Democratic primary. And that, to me, does not meet the standard that the FEC has laid out in its regulation or that's in federal law. Talk about, and this came up a little bit in 2016, as there were so many things that have uh, the president's name on it. It's something that's been lampooned since he first came out onto the public scene. He puts his name on everything. It's not the Mirage you know, Casino and Hotel. It's the Trump Mirage Casino Hotel, and his name is everywhere. Um, it, it, and there was a much made about that name recognition that if it wasn't a Clinton running against him, that would have been a real benefit for the uh, candidate Trump, that you know, everywhere you turn, there's a Trump Tower, there's a Trump Hotel, there's a Trump Resort, there's a Trump Winery, um, they, that Bloomberg's got the same thing. As a matter of fact, some of our stations that were carried on uh, use Bloomberg for their radio business news, so Bloomberg gets on the radio every time. Talk about the, the legalities of that. Well, see, that that's not a problem. You know, federal law doesn't say that if you're a business owner, for example, uh, you suddenly have to take your name off of all your holdings. So there's no requirement that that Bloomberg do that, or that, that Trump do that too. Now, on the other hand, um, if if someone decided they were who was not connected with the Trump organization decided to name their uh, new building the Trump Building because they w- they want to to basically make a contribution to the president's campaign that might be a problem mm-hmm. but like i said there, it's it's not it's not a violation of law for uh trump or bloomberg to have their names on businesses that they own um when they decide to become a candidate let's let's look at uh, again as a former fec commissioner uh, hans you you look at this and i can hear people hearing the radio who may only hear of things like citizens united and supreme court rulings on corporate donations saying oh, he's saying corporations can't give but you you said very clearly at the onset corporations can't give to an individual person but they can uh, give money to political action committees and uh, you know or, or or run ads of their own advocacy, correct? That, that's right. It, you can't make a direct contribution. So it's okay for General Motors Corporation if they decide that, hey, in the next election, it would be really good for our business if Donald Trump got reelected. If they on their own bought an ad in the New York Times saying, hey, folks, want good business, want a good economy, vote for Donald Trump, they can do that. But if they, General Motors, just said, oh, you know, we'd really like to give $2,000 to the Trump campaign to help him um, Mm -hmm. uh, run his campaign, that they cannot do. They are are prohibited from directly contributing um, to the Trump campaign. Now, they're also prohibited, a corporation, from indirectly contributing. So, for example, if if General Motors uh, owned in in an office building, in Washington, D.C., and went to the Trump campaign and said, hey, we've got some empty space. Uh, we'll let you use it for free. Mm-hmm, you, uh, mm-hmm. use, you, uh, uh, base your campaign headquarters here. They can't do that either. They can't give him free space. Um, if they if they do, that's considered a contribution to the campaign, and that also is highly illegal. Talk, talk then about, it seems like the, that we've gotten to a point in our election laws where we've had so many court rulings, so many different cases, this thing. You lay it out. Have we gotten to a point where there have been so many legal opinions on court, on um, campaign financing, that it's created massive loopholes where things can happen? Or are we getting to a place where we've reached some sort of equilibrium on, on campaign contributions? No, I think I think we're kind of at a point of equilibrium, even though people who don't really understand the law um, uh, might not might not believe that. Um, look, the courts have upheld the chief the chief reform that was put into federal law, which was saying there's a limit mm-hmm. on how much you can contribute to a federal candidate, and you can't go over that limit. So. Um, 
it, it goes up every two years based on inflation. I think the number right now is around 26 or 2700. That's how much you can, can contribute per election to a candidate like Michael Bloomberg or Donald Trump. On the other hand, uh, the Supreme Court has said you can't limit independent political expenditures, which t- to me is, is people should understand that's a basic First Amendment right. Why in the world should I not be able to, if I want to go spend my own money and buy an ad in the New York Times telling people, hey, I think you ought to vote for Michael Bloomberg. And I do it all on my own. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. coordinating with Michael Bloomberg. I'm just telling people what I think. That's my First Amendment right to engage in political speech. The Supreme Court has said, yep, you can do that, and so can corporations, because what are corporations? Well, they're just a collection of individuals, and you don't lose your First Amendment right because you decide to associate with other people. Hans von Spakovsky is on with us, uh, manager of election reform uh, initiative and senior fellow at the Mies Center for Legal and Justice Studies at the Heritage Foundation. And read some of the stuff uh, there, uh, the Daily Wire, uh, Town Hall, uh, Heritage.org as well. Hans, you raised a great point just there uh, about whether or not you know, there, there is speech levels, speech that corporations and campaign finance. Is the president really blown up a lot of what had become standard operating rhetoric regarding campaign finance? Oh, campaign finance is broken. Everything because the president in his campaign really didn't do a lot of that. And even in this impeachment arrangement, nobody has brought up anything untoward with campaign financing or monies that have came come into his campaign. It's all been stuff that he's done outwardly, not that there has been uh, influence coming in inwardly. Uh, did the 2016 presidential run of Donald Trump blow up a lot of the arguments about campaign finance reform? Yeah, I think they did. Um um, you know, back in 2000, early 2000s, when um, Congress passed its last big uh, bipartisan campaign reform bill, um, a lot of Republicans signed on to it and agreed to it. And these days, I don't think they would, because they finally understood that many of the kind of re- so-called reforms pushed by progressive uh, liberals actually infringe on the First Amendment political speech rights of everything from corporations to unions to nonprofit associations, whether it's Planned Parenthood mm-hmm. or, or the NRA, no matter what side of political aisle you're on, and individuals like like you and me. And I, I think they've learned that that those restrictions are bad. You know, people to complain about, oh, there's just too much money in our politics. Actually, if you look at the total amount spent by candidates in the last election, and you compare that to things like the amount of money Americans spend on Halloween candy, you would be amazed at how small an amount it, it really is. Oh, that's a great comparison. I think that, that's going to live forever in my pantheon of, oh, you think. Yeah, you know, a, let, me, let me ask you this then, uh, Hans. Uh, it, it, with Michael Bloomberg's announcement that he's running, he's jumped up to, I think, 6% in the polls. Uh, and then Kamala Harris, who's been there, she was one of the first ones running, uh, is out because she can't raise enough money to keep going. Is Bloomberg also teaching us that these two-year, three-year campaigns for president are ludicrous, uh, unsustainable, and really, uh, you know, are almost counterproductive? And wait until you know the American population is ready to start hearing about this before you start campaigning. Yeah, it really is extraordinary, and I know people get awfully tired of it. And um, it's amazing how much a national campaign. Um, cost these days. Uh, folks may not realize this, but actually it was Barack Obama, who I believe, who broke the billion dollar mark mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. terms of the amount of money he raised and, and spent on his election. He raised and spent a lot uh, of money. Um, the total, the total, I, the last time I looked, I think the total spent on all campaigns, so not just president, but congressional campaigns, et cetera, was about $4 billion. Mm. Um, mm. So, yeah, it is an extraordinary amount of money. But on the other hand, particularly for a national campaign, this is a very big country. 
Yeah. You know, 50, 50 states plus the District of Columbia, uh, thousands of counties. Um, You've got to try to reach, you know, 300 some plus million people across the country. That's that's not cheap. Just ask any commercial advertiser. <laughs> talk, talk to anybody, whether it's Coca-Cola or again General Motors, and ask them how much it costs them to advertise their products. And that's what candidates are doing. Yeah. They are advertising themselves to voters, saying, "Here's who I am as a person." And here, here are the solutions that I have for the problems we face. You know, as you brought up Barack Obama, Hans, and much was made, Donna Brazile's uh, autobiography exposed the fact that a lot of what wound up happening with the Clinton Foundation and the Democratic Party was because the party was left broke uh, at the end of the 2012 campaign. Um, and and then I watched the documentary The Swamp, where several members of Cong- Congress exposed the fact that there is a price list for seats on committees to help party build. I've tracked that uh, policy back to, uh, at very least, Newt Gingrich, but Nancy Pelosi has particularly uh, been very strict about, you know, you want a seat on this committee, well, it's going to cost you this much in fundraising for the party, uh, not your individual campaigns. What about the power of these parties? We've read quite a bit about the uh, ineptitude of the Virginia Republican Party post the General Assembly election, inability to get candidates to run for some Senate seats. How seats, uh, not a lot of effort done as a ground game. Talk about the, 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 that side of it, the, the political parties' power on this and how much money they have, uh, and, 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 and should we be concerned about that? The political parties actually have much less power today than they used to have, and a lot of that is the direct result of so-called campaign reform laws which severely restricted the amount of money that could be given to the political parties and severely restricted the amount the political parties could spend on their candidates. And because of that, um, you know, it's like stopping, it's like trying to stop water flowing out of, out of a, a hose pipe. It's going to find someplace else to go. And so what's happened is, a lot of the money that used to go to the political parties instead is going to all these independent groups instead, uh, over which oh. the parties have no, no real control. I and see. so that has that has weakened the power of of the political parties, and I think actually has helped lead uh, increased kind of the stagnation that we have. Um, in Congress and elsewhere because, you know, candidates aren't really dependent on the political parties for funds. They, they can go out, raise it on their own, plus try to get the help of other other groups that are not the parties to help them. All right. Interesting thought. I had not thought about that. Hans von Spakovsky, Manager of Election Law Reform Initiative and Senior Fellow with the Mies Center for Legal and Justice Studies at the Heritage Foundation. I have to ask you about this. It's you know relatively new news, uh, so uh, if you want to beg out saying you know, I haven't read completely into it, but the story is boiling across the uh, House Intelligence Committee report, uh, screaming out of it is that somehow they have phone records of not just uh, the president and his private lawyer, but other members of the Intelligence Committee. I'm, I'm still fascinated as to how that could happen without the ranking member knowing that he, they were you know, going to AT&T for their phone records. It, it, aside from impeachment, aside from Ukraine, aside from the Biden campaign or Burisma, is this issue something that's going to have Americans saying, whoa, 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 what do you mean AT&T just gave phone records to uh, the government for surveillance? Pete, this should be a big story. This is, an ext- this is unbelievable. I mean, this is, this is as unbelievable as the fact that we had uh, federal law enforcement officials authorize uh, electronic eavesdropping and spying on the Trump campaign. That had never happened in American history. The, the use of federal law enforcement powers to spy on the opposition party's campaign. And now we had a member of Congress, the head of the Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, 
spying on his fellow members of his committee and getting their phone records that is that is so abusive such an abuse of of uh the powers of government that i am just astonished that this occurred and frankly the republicans need to raise cane about this I've brought up as a very arcane issue, and a lot of my friends roll their eyes and say, oh, here goes Joe again talking about amendments we don't like to talk about because nobody knows them off the top of their head. We all know the first and the second and the fourth and the fifth. Uh, And uh, certainly I bring up that Hong Kong is simply protesting for their Sixth Amendment. But but this idea of AT&T having this sort of information – I believe, is a Third Amendment violation because technically then that is officers of the government technically could be determined to be soldiers stationed in our homes via our uh, telephones. Well, that's that's good. I hadn't thought of that. But uh, I I think it is an extraordinary violation of privacy and um, this this should not have happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, it should not have happened. And like I said, the, the Republicans need to raise cane about it in, inside the House of Representatives. The Washington Post said, we presume they had uh, authorization for this. This is what the media has come to, Hans, is that right. the, the Washington Post, the station that you know, the, 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 the newspaper that published the Pentagon Papers and, and pushed for Watergate is saying, yeah, I guess they were okay with that. <laughs> you know, Rizzo Boy Richard Nixon is spinning in his grave saying, why didn't they give me that? kind of benefit of the doubt well you know what would they would be saying if adam schiff had get to gotten the records of their reporters they would be screaming about it well but a reporter was one of them uh, you know not a washington post reporter but a reporter uh, john solomon was one of these folks whose at&t records were collected uh, without a warrant it seems or any sort of uh, authorization so uh, woe be any other reporter what happens if it's a republican who decides he wants to get a record of somebody at the washington post or or the the new york times now, see, that they would object to. But, you know, the Post, they're not going to object to John Solomon because John Solomon has been doing extraordinary reporting about the corruption inside Ukraine and exactly what Hunter Biden and Joe Biden were doing there. And as you know, that's a story that the rest of the media wants mm-hmm. to ignore. But isn't – I brought this up to our listeners. Isn't that – I mean, just the fact that a a foreign natural gas company – thinks it's important enough to have the vice president's son on their board doesn't tell you that tell you enough about you know what what's going on with the power of our government and the uh, I, I don't know if it's the ability of our government to be a venture capitalist firm with our tax money or not uh, but the power of our government is has gotten way off the skids if if the son of the vice president gets a great gig on a company that he's never even been to the country of uh, to serve on a board of directors directors of a business he has no experience in just so that they have access to the executive branch of our government that that frightens me as to how powerful our government has become yeah and it worked it worked <laughs> yeah. because remember joe biden the vice president said that he threatened ukraine and they stopped yep. a corruption investigation by one of their own prosecutors uh, of that company. So, in fact, their gamble of, of hiring this guy actually worked and stopped a corruption investigation of him. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. We're not supposed to be talking about yeah, that. Yeah, that didn't actually happen. That's a, that's all been debunked, uh, supposedly, Hans. So, so at the end of the day, back to uh, Bloomberg, do you think the Bloomberg candidacy is real? Uh, is this just another person who is very clearly saying, uh, Joe Biden's got to go, uh, and and so I'm going to get in, and we're seeing more of that happen uh, because the the 17 or so candidates haven't uh, been able to resonate with the American people. And are there other people out there that we haven't heard from yet that might be interested in doing something like this? I think he uh, it may be that the reason he's in, but also. Michael Bloomberg has an enormous ego, and I guess in his own mind, he might actually think he could he could win and be elected president. I don't think there's any chance of that. But uh, it, look, it's it's pretty clear there are how many candidates still left in the race, and they 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 just don't have. I don't think they have the kind of really strong candidate they need to yeah. to uh, oppose uh, Donald Trump. 
Well, and and as a man who studies election reform, remember Michael Bloomberg's the one that changed the charter of the city of New York so he could stay mayor for an extra uh, term. So uh, you know <laughs> that that could be fun and bumpy if if he gets the presidency and uh, all of a sudden says, "Yeah, I don't I don't uh, think we should have a two term limit on that." Uh, it could it could raise some interesting times. Right. Absolutely. Hans, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Even the sidebar under these, uh, you know, AT&T records. And again, it's heritage.org, uh, Daily Wire as well, uh, their uh, newsletter, their newspaper online. Uh, Hans, very uh, enjoy the rest of the Christmas season. We'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Coming up next on Freedom and Prosperity Radio, we're going to talk to the Reason Foundation, Zach Christensen, on their pension integrity project. Of course, Virginia has our own issues with pension problems, and we see it uh, bubbling out under all over the place. And we'll visit with Zach next on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Freedom and Prosperity Radio.